demain. Euh, les inscriptions se font dans le Both Lounge qui est au rez-de-chaussée, euh, où vous pouvez vous inscrire dès maintenant. Le programme de cet après-midi euh, va nous permettre d'appréhender l'impact de l'open source euh, dans le monde du business avec euh, des représentants de sociétés non open source pour ouvrir euh, ce premier panel de l'après-midi. Euh, comment ces sociétés sont-elles impactées par leur déploiement de l'open source euh, dans leurs relations avec leurs clients, leurs partenaires comme leurs employés Comment s'en servent-elles comme catalyseur de changement Et pour animer la discussion, vous pouvez accueillir Andrew Aitken, euh, qui est un acteur influent dans le monde de l'open source et qu'on ne présente plus. plus. Andrew Merci, bonjour. Et c'est l'extension extent de mon French, je pardon, pardon me. Um, My name is Andrew Aitken, and I'm the founder and managing partner of a firm called Alliance Group. For 11 years, uh, we've been the leading open source business and strategy consulting firm. And in December of last year, we actually were acquired by Black Duck Software. So now I'm a, uh, we're a division of Black Duck. The panel today, the topic is how does open source, how does the open source ethos change, or how can it be used to change, reinvigorate, re-energize closed source companies? We have two wonderful, wonderful panelists, and I'll introduce them in just a second. So <clears throat> I think we're aware of how much open source technology has changed the, the technology landscape. I think we understand how companies like Red Hat and Sugar and, and Alfresco and others have changed how software companies do business. They've introduced a new type of business model. They've introduced frictionless distribution, collaboration amongst themselves and their partners and their customers. But <clears throat> what we're going to talk about is how closed source companies are actually using what we call the open source ethos to change themselves, to re-energize themselves and their customers and their partners and the conversations they have. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to bring up my panelists today. Can you please join me? <clears throat> I'm very, very pleased to have Aaron Peterson from A AOL, who is VP of Paid Engineering Services. Is that the new title as of last week? Correct. Paid Services Engineering. And next to her, we have Peter Golly, who is Chief Community Evangelist at Microsoft and editor of the Port 25 blog their uh, open source blog. <clears throat> so they're extremely well positioned and experienced to top, talk about this uh, topic. Um, AOL is, is really using open source to help reinvigorate the company and in, in, in her own words, help make them more and more relevant again. And we'll hear about uh, how she's going about that. And of course, Microsoft has come a long, long ways <clears throat> in their perspective and engagement with open source, and, and Peter's going to tell us about that. So when I use the term open source ethos, what does that actually mean? To me, there are four absolute core elements to it. There's transparency, there's collaboration, meritocracy, all supported by a licensing model That, support, that provides certain protections and rights. Now, I'd like to start, my first question would be to ask them, <clears throat> what is the open source ethos to you, Erin? Thank you. <clears throat> I'm famously soft-spoken, so I hope everyone in the back can hear me. For, for me, the characteristics that define the open source ethos are transparency, communication, and collaboration. And I think that Uh, one would be hard-pressed to define any system or project or product without those three characteristics to be open. And in turn, I think that projects that successfully evince those characteristics are themselves open. And those are three characteristics that are very important to us. And carrying from the third party, outside our wall, open source projects into those projects within AOL. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, openness and transparency is, is very important, right? And at Microsoft, um, bringing in that kind of ethos and, and broadening our horizons has been very important. Actually changing the, 
the, the way the development methodology and the thinking around development methodologies internally has been something that we've spent a lot of time doing and thinking of. And creating a level of transparency internally and externally in, in the work that we do and the relationships that we have with the open source community has been very, very important and a, a very huge differentiator, I think, in the way people think about the company and when people think about coming to work at Microsoft, the fact that um, op open source um, is endemic across the company and, and hundreds of people, if not thousands a day, in some way touch open source and, and touch what they understand to be that developed methodology, to that, that level of collaboration and openness and transparency is um, something that has certainly improved our business and uh, improved, I think, the way we all think about the company that we work for. Okay, thank you, Peter. So, Aaron, I think the audience might be interested in learning how you're using open source from a higher level perspective to kind of reinvigorate the, the company. So at AOL, we made a decision, an active decision, that for us to really engage in the transformation of the company that we really have to undertake to be competitive in the 21st century, it would be important for us to adopt open source products, technologies, and practices. And for us, this was important, both from the perspective that we believe it would allow us to develop better products faster for our customers and for our audience, but at least as important for us was the opportunity this gave us to help our engineering team catch up to engineering teams outside AOL's walls. AOL has a history and a legacy of amazing engineering. We built some of the largest, scalable, most reliable products in the, in the 90s and even in the late 80s. But this had really gone a bit stagnant for us over the last 10 years. And as we spun out of Time Warner, and we really started to look at our fundamentals and how we're executing, we realized that to move forward faster, we're going to have to find good ways to invigorate our engineering team. So working with the open source community has allowed us to do a couple of things. It's allowed us to very quickly take advantage of products and projects that already existed, not go ahead and rebuild the wheel, which allowed us to upgrade our technologies. And at least as importantly, it allowed us to import from the open source community those characteristics, that ethos, into our own engineering teams that allowed us to be much more effective. So uh, I think anyone here who's worked in a large company realizes that it can be very difficult, for example, to communicate between teams or to share technologies between teams in big companies. And that's, those two sentiments are antithetical to how open source teams work. And so having our internal teams realize and partnering with open source projects that they would benefit from being very clear and transparent about everything from their code to their documentation and collaborate better internally has really helped us improve very quickly. And you're eight months into this effort, but it has already begun Correct. to make significant amount of change in the organization. Before you reflect on that, tell us how did you actually get started? I mean, why, is there, why was there an initial belief that open source might be the way to go for AOL? I believe that if one is approaching a large-scale software project today, 2011, uh, one would be hard-pressed not to approach it as an open source project. I just don't think it would be possible right now to be competitive, certainly on a global basis, if you didn't have an open source project on your fingertips. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. Software right now changes too quickly. In a services-oriented world, uh, everyone is making changes very quickly to their software. One company will never have all the smartest people working for it. And if you have an open source project, you have a, a much higher likelihood of having many of the smartest minds working or at least contributing to your project. So for us to step back and really think about what it means to be competitive now, that was, that was just sort of fundamental for us. Peter, I think it's an interesting story how you actually came to be at, at Microsoft. Uh, you were a rather strong naysayer before you joined them, weren't you? Yeah. So um, I was a journalist for 10 years. I worked in the United States working for Ziff Davis Enterprise, which is one of the largest tech publishing companies. And I worked for a magazine called eWeek, which is one of the top trade publications. And my, the beat that I covered was um, software platforms. So it was Windows, Unix, and Linux, pretty much. 
And uh, so it was wonderful because I had, I had a foot, so to speak, in each of those camps. So I would talk to Microsoft executives and, and see how they thought about open source and talk to the open source folks. But uh, I was very cynical and it certainly showed in my coverage um, about Microsoft's true commitment um, and some of its methodologies. But over time, um, I watched the progress and the changes in the company and particularly as it started to talk about uh, its embrace of open source and its support of open source. And when the words started turning into actions, I think is the time when I actually started to believe that this really was a sincere effort. You can talk marketing for as much as you want, but when you actually start contributing and you start being part of the community and you start showing up in a real way, um, and that was what really motivated me. And when they approached me to become the open source community manager, it just seemed like such an amazing role. I, firstly, um, to be the open source community manager in Microsoft is an enormous challenge, and I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I love challenges, so that, that was just an amazing thing. But also, the ability to, to influence, to really influence thinking inside the company towards a fundamental change, and to know that in 10 years' time, our business will look very different, and to have been part of the team that, that helped think, affect the thinking around that was very important. And I really did reflect on, I had been a reporter for eight years, I had written some very critical, some very important stories about the company, and I had never really seen any behavioral change as a result of what I had written. It hit the market, it was there for a day or so, something else came along and it moved on. And the ability to sit in a room with some of the greatest minds and some of the real people who make decisions that change the way Microsoft thinks and to be a voice in those conversations and to actually introduce a viewpoint, an open source viewpoint that may not be something that they were familiar with was just one of the most uh, really highlights of my career. And you know, we have very, 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 very uh, interesting discussions internally. I win some, I lose more probably than I win. But, but the fact is that you're there and you're inputting and you're having an influence. And I think that for me summarizes how, how open source is permeating with Microsoft. The idea that they would hire someone who had been extremely critical of them in a fundamental role, transformative role is, is kind of emblematic to me of, of how the company has changed. Some might say, though, that by hiring you, they kind of took a thorn out of their public face, didn't they? I still have, uh, I still have two blogs. I still, all my friends are still in the press. Um, I, 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 think, I think some could say that, and, and, but I, I don't think you shut the voice down. I think what they realized was we should, we should take that critical thinking, that, that cr thinking which is not the type of thinking we have, and bring it internal so we can voice it and deal with it and think about it and grow from it. And that's certainly the, the, what I have seen happen most of the time. So early on in that comment, you mentioned how you began to see words change, in, change into actions. Yeah. So as you've been there, how, what does that look like internally? I mean, how, how has that come to be? Well, let's, let's just look at, at Windows Azure and the cloud, right? Um, for the first time in Microsoft's history, we have built a a platform from the ground up to be open. I mean, from day one, the commitment to Windows Azure was that it would be an open platform. It would support multiple languages. It would support developer tools across across the platform. So I think that was really important, and, and we've committed to that. Um, so that's one way. The other way is the number of communities that we participate in. We, um, our engineers are, are, are working with um, Joint um, and Node.js to make Node.js um, run really, really well on Windows. And that's beneficial, of course, to Microsoft because Windows then becomes a better product. But it's better to the community because um, they then able they have interoperability with the Windows platform. We work with um, the PHP community across multiple projects. We work with WordPress and Joomla, and I think. All of those, instead of just you know giving them money or showing up at their conferences, our engineers are now developing bridges and working with them to create solutions that that will make um, technology technologies interoperate in a far better way, and that's good for the entire ecosystem. Well, <clears throat> so I think we're a lot of us are familiar, or many, many of us may be familiar with your external contributions to open source today. Um, that's becoming more and more clear and understood, yeah. but. How did you begin to change the mindset internally? How, how come the product people are actually now participating in some of these initiatives? It's beyond just your group. Yeah, yeah. So, so 
let me just sketch the history here. So uh, seven, seven years ago, maybe between six or seven years ago, um, Bill Health was appointed by Microsoft to create an open source lab in the company. And he, they pulled a pipe through the wall and they gave him a space and they said, okay, this is yours. And he set up hundreds, by the end of, the, the, the t of his tenure, he set up hundreds of servers running every distribution of Linux, running Unix. Um, and people started to come to him from the product group and ask questions like, how fast does it run? How optimized is it? What features does it have that, 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 that are important? And, and there was a realization that there was a huge amount of interest and a huge amount of benefit within the company that had nowhere to go until there was a formal presence, one, one person. That resulted in the creation of a platform strategy team that was devoted to, to looking at open source across the company. And we hired Sam Ramji, Many of you may or may not know him, and he became um, he led that team. And so then there was a we were able to go into the product groups and we were able to address specific issues and specific challenges. And from there, um, the product groups were empowered to actually make decisions to look at. At, at technologies that were compatible with them, to think about how they contributed to the open source community. And you know, every now and then, just this week, for example, I'll see an article in the press about something we've done with open source that I didn't know about. And there's two ways of looking at that. One is like, oh my god, how could I not know? And the other is, this is so amazing that people across the company are doing open source and are committed to it and are releasing it in, in, in a way that, that, that shows that it, it, is, it, is, um, it is profoundly distributed across the, the different groups at Microsoft. Okay, I, I want to come back to that, but, but Aaron, um, when we were, we were talking actually yesterday about this, you, AOL has actually made, has come a long way in, in the last eight months. You've made some sea changes, but the way you described it, well, I'll let you describe it, but it was a bunch of small steps, right? Not, not big steps. That's right, so there had been a, we'd had a brief conversation yesterday and, and because we have moved so far in the last eight to nine months, I think the assumption, and this sort of surprised me, was that we had somehow issued an edict from on high and we all moved very quickly. And what I found is that in a big company, it can be very difficult to make those really big changes. It's hard for people to really wrap their heads around big changes. It's hard to build faith around big changes that they can occur. It's very hard to get people to uh, commit to making really big changes. But when you break the really big changes down into dozens and dozens of small changes, it allows for a, a couple of things to happen. One was something that I expected and wanted to happen, and one was a surprise. The thing that I expected and wanted to happen was that if people could commit to a small aspect of the project and see that through to completion, they would be more likely to be able to find the time and the resources and out, out of the regular day-to-day -day schedule. But what uh, the happy unexpected benefit was that in doing so and being successful in all those small changes, we had people build credibility in the overall initiative to move AOL uh, farther ahead. So while initially it felt that we were moving so slowly and making these changes, there was an inflection point about, I would say right now about three months ago, and it came about two months after I was starting to lose a little bit of hope. But we hit this inflection point where suddenly there was all these people across the company who had each made a small contribution and the rate at which we were able to move ahead as a group and see these small contributions pay off in big changes accelerated. And that's resulted in an overall acceleration of the adoption of these open source changes. You are giving some really interesting numbers around how, how fast your product development cycles have mm -hmm. changed in the company. And, so, and you referenced one that had been done in a couple days, I believe? Uh, there, was, there was a couple of small projects we've done in a couple of days, but notably there was one project that had initially been scoped to take six to ten months. And at AOL, that's a relatively fast execution cycle. I realize that for uh, startups and smaller companies, that's relatively slow. But when we began talking to the engineering team and we pointed out the number of places that they could consume open source technologies that were external to AOL and consume other parts of the AOL stack that teams had been working to open source, it cut our development cycle to eight weeks. So we were able to get a product out the door from, as I like to say, PowerPoint, from, from slideware to delivery in, in exactly eight weeks, Monday to Monday. And it was a beautiful product and it was very well architected. And one of the things that it really freed the team up to do is instead of having to focus on the nuts and bolts of executing and building out that, that part of the platform, 
because they consumed other open source technologies, it allowed them to focus on the, the top part of the stack, the application layer, and one core part of the underlying platform and really deliver things that were really interesting for customers. And so we were able to de deliver not only a product faster, but we delivered a fundamentally better product faster. Okay. Thank you. So Peter, you, um, I know that the, a lot of the groundwork has been done, but you still view part of your role, and I, I know Janugo review, uh, views a large part of his role is internal evangelism today. So tell me about that process, because you guys are on the road internally yeah. a lot. Right? Yeah, so obviously um, the, the strength that you bring is the understanding of a, of a specific role. So my manager, Gianluca Rabellino, recently joined uh, Microsoft. He spent his entire 20-year career in, uh, in open source, leading open source companies. And the fact that, that he came inside to lead our open source community development was, was in itself an action that spoke louder than words. But what we do, what's really important to us, is, is, is advise business groups within Microsoft about how to relate with open source communities, how to think about open source methodologies, how to, how to think about licensing products and working with communities, how to think about the broader interoperability strategy, how, how this will, will benefit um, not just their product, but, but, but businesses across the Microsoft ecosystem. And so, uh, you know, developers, a lot of people have been at Microsoft a long time. This is not a development framework that they're comfortable with or that they're experienced with. So it's wonderful, you know, it, it, it's, it's like a startup in some ways. You go in and you talk to people about changing fundamentally some of the ways they think about their job and the way they think about the world. And, and it's, 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 it's amazing and it, it, you know, obviously there are challenges and, and we deal with those too, but I think fundamentally being able to have discussions where you, you move people from one way of thinking to another or at least open their eyes to the possibility that open source is something they really should be thinking about on an ongoing basis in their daily work because at the end of the day, what drives us is, is what our customers need and what our partners want from us. 90% of our revenue comes from partners. So if you're not listening and if you're not internally thinking about how you can meet those requirements and respond to those needs, you're, um, you're not going to be successful as a, as a business moving forward. And I think the cloud in particular was an example of where, where that played out for us, where we realized that we needed to support um, you, you know, all the existing standards, REST, um, WSI, all of, all of that, and we had to become more involved in open standards as well and to make sure that we were implementing those across our product so that interoperability was built into the product at a core level. So two two point follow on to that. Um, what's what's the biggest remaining internal challenge? And and before that one is is there a single message? Literally, is there a single message that has resonated across most groups, or is it more individual? It's it's been more individual. Obviously, when you're talking about an uh, an office productivity suite versus a um, a business engine that, that that drives caching, you're having different types of conversations. The bottom line, though, is is that the way you interact with a community is 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 pretty consistent, and. You know, we've had a long history of engaging with community. It's just been an internal community. So you just have to think about how you broaden that. Microsoft's um, um, developer base is enormous. Our partner base is enormous. We, we have been interfacing with the, that community. So you use that as an analogy to, to, for people to understand how you can broaden that and the benefits that come with broadening that. So it's, each of these are, are really one-on-one um, -on -one conversations that have an underlying commonality, but certainly a lot of difference amongst them. Um, you know, ch challenges, I think, I think the, the changing landscape and the rapidity with which the landscape changes is, is and, and us as, as thought leaders looking at that landscape and thinking about how we can play into that is, is, is the challenge that, that, that I certainly, certainly face. What is, you know, how do, we, how do we move the company forward in the ecosystem? How is the ecosystem moving forward itself? I think the, those, are the, those are the things that I, I think about on a, on a regular basis. How can we become more invested in, in, in communities and, and how do we roll that out in a way that is beneficial to ourselves, to our partners, to our customers, to the, to the ecosystem itself? Okay, thank you. So Aaron, what's been the, uh, two, again, two-part question. So what's been the biggest challenge you've had to overcome and what's been the, the biggest pleasant surprise? Start with the biggest challenge. 
The biggest challenge that I've had to overcome is something that I think is familiar to anyone who has been in a big company that is traditionally a closed company and has tried to help it make an open company. You know, I've spent time at startups. I've spent time in a startup that went from a startup to a relatively big company. And one of the things I've learned in a big company is that things move slower, and so you have to develop sort of a patience for that. But within a, when a, within a big closed company that you're trying to shift open source, there are a lot of habits on how engineering teams engage that aren't particularly transparent and aren't particularly cooperative. And one of the things that was quite a surprise was that when I stopped trying to help change that problem, help, help find a solution there, and instead helped teams work more effectively with external open source projects, the experiences that individual teams and individual members of teams had with external projects and how much more fun, frankly, it is to work on open source projects led them to change much faster internally. They became much more amenable to working across internal lines, for example. And so suddenly the quality of documentation started going up and the level of cooperation and transparency between teams started going up. And that was really a fantastic surprise. So we, we have just a, a minute left, um, but follow on, no, stay there. Um, <laughs> So we were chatting with the, your CTO yesterday, mm -hmm. and the question was, have you been able to quantify any of the hard benefits? And he was pretty clear that there are two areas where you've been able to quantify some benefits in this, tradition, in this transition to open source, beyond just faster product development and better yep. products. Those two key places have been in our retention and in our overall uh, levels of morale, both the things that big companies measure frequently. Uh, we, there are key people who would have left the company who have not left because they have found uh, two things. One, they can continue to contribute to open source projects and we strongly encourage them to do so. And the people who are working on those projects are having so much fun working on those from AOL that they're much less likely to respond to other offers. A great example is uh, there's a team led by a guy named Jonathan Crane. A lot of people who have been at AOL for 10, 15 years and they've all banded together, and they have a working group that's specifically working on contributing some key features to the Hadoop community. And they're having so much fun that our retention amongst that group of employees has really become a lot easier. And then there are other key individuals that I know have stayed, specifically because they're now having so much more, more fun than they were before. Okay, thank you. So, Peter, in the last few, few seconds, um, coming from the organization or entity that may have been, had the most uh, valid and maybe not so much valid malignment out there in the public, what would you recommend to other large traditional closed source companies that may be in the audience? How do they get started? What's the most important thing they can do to begin making, using open source to change internally? Well, certainly for a big company, it's, um, it's identify, bring somebody who, who is well known either within your company or externally um, in the area and make them the, part, the face, the internal face and the public face of your company's commitment to open source. Because you'll be, you'll be amazed, as, as we were at Microsoft, at what is lying under the covers. And when there is a point for it to be reached out to you, um, it comes. And that person also is the public is the public face and, and it's easier. For example, we now have Jean Hugo and myself as open source community leaders. People are invited to come and talk to us about community. They're invited to come and talk to us about doing business with Microsoft. We can, we can reference them across the company. Having one point of contact in a 90,000 person company is a huge, huge motivator and also a huge um, benefit in cutting through some of the red tape that people would, ha would have real problems in, in wanting to get their solution um, interoperable with Windows. All right. Well, I would like to thank you both very much for sharing some, some really good insights on this topic. And thank you all for, for being here today. That's the uh, end of our panel. Thank you. Thank you.